So, without further ado, I will hand over to Nigel from the RSPB. Thank you very much, Liz, and good morning to everybody. Um, I'm um, the, uh, actually, if I start to share my screen, uh, that's giving me the prompts, won't it? And then we don't have to. Let's hope and pray that this works. Are we seeing slides? A slide. Yes. Yep. Brilliant. So, yes, um, my name's Nigel Symes, and I am the head of business conservation strategy at the RSPB. That means um, it's my job to work out and develop how we go about working with businesses and business communities and business sectors in order to help them to help us to address the nature crisis, which I'll say a bit more about in a moment. Um, and we have been working with the solar um, energy sector for quite a number of years, but in some detail for the last six years in a partnership, first with UNESCO and now with a company called Lightrock, um, who I'll say a bit more about as we go along. Um, but we're trying to get the slides to advance and it doesn't seem to want to. Um, that's it. Thank you. Um, mouse was in the wrong place. Apologies. So, um, yeah, yeah, we, we work with the solar energy, uh, sector, um, for a couple of fundamental reasons. Uh, one is, as Liz mentioned, nature is in crisis. The climate is also in crisis. These are dual emergencies. They are very closely connected. And um, for us, there are many solutions that can be um, put in place and have to be done so with urgency. Um, you know, you only have to look at the news now, and it's it's quite interesting how the news have picked up on on the, the sort of global heating issue um, recently, as Southern Europe is is suffering incredible heat um, and storms and so forth. Um, even though I spent the last uh, three or four days in Yorkshire, where I think the temperature barely got above fifteen degrees, but that's never mind. Um, these are real. Um, and we know that biodiversity has been in decline for at least the last 50 years in a very dramatic um, way. We monitor as an organisation um, wildlife um, and as a, in a partnership with others, we produce a, um, a report called the State of Nature uh, every two years and that looks across lots and lots of different uh, wildlife types birds butterflies bees reptiles etc cetera, etc cetera, um using uh standard methodology so this is this is sort of proven techniques to measure declines measure increases where increases take place and you know, we, we need to be certain that at the same time as there's some very dramatic declines there are also some quite um uh optimistic um signs that nature can recover with the right uh, kind of um help and um depending on where you're from but in this part of the world's bedfordshire um it is difficult now to look up in the sky and not see a red kite whereas 20 years ago there was no chance of seeing red kites um and red kites have until recently been considered a globally threatened species so um it gives you some sense sense for optimism so we need to be able to address um, the the climate crisis so that uh, a things chance of survival, but also wildlife. And I think I was listening to something on the radio yesterday where they were talking about sort of successional uh, hits on um, <clears throat> on wildlife by by the climate uh, change, um, and say so there, there are these dual reasons why. Um, for us, it's really important that we address this. 
we need a low carbon energy um, policy and delivery across the country. Uh, of this, there is no doubt. Um, you, you know, and the forecasts are for, for dramatic increases in demand for, um, for energy. Um, so we are looking at um, a whole range of, of renewable sources, low, low energy, uh, low carbon sources of, of energy. And solar is certainly part of that. Um, we mainly work in and focus on the field solar on the basis that they uh, have the capacity to deliver at um, you know high 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 capacity um, outputs. We're not um, ignoring though other um, like rooftop and have uh, done some campaigning around um, building regulations and so on to see more rooftop solar. Um, <clears throat> we have a kind of holding position, if you like, about floating solar on the basis that quite a lot of the sites that have been suggested for um, floating solar are quite important for wintering um, ducks and geese and so forth. And so uh, there may well be a, a conflict or a contention there. Um, so yeah, we, as I say, we we support um, uh, as an organisation uh, low and low carbon energy solutions with a low impact on nature. And I mean, I'm here to, talking to you today because we believe that with the right guidance and and the right design, um, field solar can be just that. Um, Yes, there are issues with land take, and there have been quite a bit in the media about the um, loss of uh, food production capacity if the countryside is covered in solar, um, and therefore the food security issue, which um, <clears throat> we refute on the basis that the land take is tiny, most solar uh, most land offered for solar is the less productive areas of the farm and um, we uh, advocate for a change in um, well marketing I suppose of food products and so forth so there's less dependence on the land to provide animal feed which so is then sort of um, it only arrives in the human food chain, sort of second or third hand. And I think that's quite an important issue about how we manage land to have space for solar as well as productive farming. And I, we as an organisation believe that these two can go hand in hand. There are issues where solar proposals are put forward where the land is actually quite good for, for wildlife, for nature as, as it stands. And therefore we have, um, we call it casework, but basically we're case by case, we will assess the development proposals and decide whether or not we're going to put in objections and then campaign against them. We don't have, or sorry, we have done very little of that for um, solar sites so far, um, simply because most of the land being put forward is a relatively low value for wildlife. One or two exceptions, but... Um, you know, in general, that's the case. Um, so we've, as I said earlier, we've been working with um, Light Rock now for nearly three years. And we've, what we do with them is help them to develop the, the sort of landscape plans, the vegetation plans for the solar sites. So as to be able to introduce, uh, incorporate into the, um, the development plans, habitats for wildlife. Um, we're very lucky in that Light Rock are very um, proactive for, for nature. Um, and I'm going to say more about biodiversity and that gain in, in a moment, um, but the the statutory um, or mandated requirement for biodiversity net gain coming forward is that there's a 10% gain. I mean, you'll hear 110%, but that's just, you know, the um, what has to be replaced is 110%. Um, so the same plus 10%. Um, and Light Rock committed right on day one um, to go as far beyond that as possible. And I'll, I'll talk you through a, a scenario as to, to how that's quite achievable. 
Um, so they, they're genuinely committed. Um, yes, there are benefits to them of working with the RSBB because of our uh, brand scale and that sort of stuff. But it's um, that's not really why they're doing it. I think there is a, there's a genuine desire to see the industry develop into a highly responsible industry and biodiversity is, is part of that. And I'm going to talk a bit about nature-based solutions as well, and I'll come to what that means in, in a bit. Um, and part for us, as well as getting the habitats built into the plan so they're delivered on the ground and then maintained for the 25, 30 years there afterwards, and potentially beyond that as sites are likely, I think, to be um, re-equipped rather than um, go back to farming. Um, we want to be able to demonstrate to others uh, what can be achieved and how it's viable, how it's easy to manage relative to the, the management effort and cost of, of maintaining a standard, if you like, um, solar farm vegetation where it's either mown or grazed. And what we're suggesting is something a bit different, which I'll talk about in a moment again. And yeah, I mean, our aspiration is to influence and help this, the sector as a whole. We're, um, we're working with Light Rock in a bespoke way, but we want to work with the sector and um, talking to the trade bodies about this. So, um, Solar development usually takes place on farmed land, as I've said. Um, that farmed land, there is some uh, kind of, what's the word, but not misconception, but, but a, an understanding, a belief that farmed, because it's green, is good for nature. Whereas we know that that's not in many cases the case, because most of the farmland birds and things like bumblebees and butterflies have declined dramatically over years because the farming practices that farmers have had to do to remain competitive have um, changed. We actually own the RSBB, a farm in Cambridgeshire, which we use as a demonstration farm. It's called Hope Farm. Um, and it's amazing in the sense that we set out with a view that we had to maintain our, it is a productive, profitable farm. Um, and we've benchmarked it against other farms in the, in the neighborhood, but to um, apply conservation measures to be able to get um, a reversal of the declines in birds and bees and, and so forth. And we've done that. And it's been amazingly successful, far more successful than we ever anticipated. And so it is now very influential in terms of things like the agri-environment schemes. The point about raising, mentioning that is that what we then recommend in solar developments is to apply some of those features that we apply on uh, ordinary farmland, open farmland within the, the solar um, development footprint to benefit um, farmland birds and, and, and wildlife. But when you're so when you do this, you're not um, competing in the same way for land. Um, and I'll talk again a bit more about the the amount of land available within the solar development for for nature, and it's quite considerable when you start to add it up. Um, those uh, new habitats for wildlife um, provide what we term, I think, it's a new term generally, nature-based solutions. So those are where nature is helping to fix some of the environmental problems, one of which is sequestering carbon. So if you take um, land out of farming, which is a carbon cost, um, farming is an emitter of uh, greenhouse gases, quite considerable in the terms of arable farmland and dairy, intensive dairy, um, and you effectively rest it for 25, 30 years, it's taking up carbon. Um, as well as generating low energy or uh, low carbon energy. Um, it also does uh, a job, a service in terms of filtering um, pollution. So 
runoff from fields that are enriched with fertilizer before they hit water courses um and they provide nectar sources and i've just realized i'm going to talk a bit more about that later so um i'll, I'll spare you that just at the moment we do have uh you know as i said earlier a number of of, of challenges around um where solar is proposed on higher biodiversity land and there was a classic case good for years ago now rampisham down in dorset which was a very important grassland site with very many species of orchids and so on and it was fought very hard i think he went to the secretary of state um for a decision and so forth eventually it was turned down uh and so the developer went ne literally next door where there was an improved um agricultural fields and so that was a win-win but that really was a threat to a very important grassland site and so you know we have to protect good sites but there's huge amounts of land available for um solar um that is of low uh value for biodiversity um we think that with the um the advent of biodiversity net gain that it will mean that fewer of these high value sites will come forward because it'll be more expensive for a developer to develop um rather than um you know a low value um, alternative and again i'll come back i think biodiversity net gain is going to be a real crux a real kind of get it right and it will work really well um for the um, solar development um going forward within the sites i mean and, and one of the things that i think we we why one of the reasons why we want to be involved is to be able to help and we provide advice that's kind of our fundamental kind of way of working to businesses to sectors either through publishing guidance running training courses or working hand in hand with individual developers to be able to get the designs right we're challenged by some of the management regimes and some of the kind of rationale for the management regimes on solar sites, which really, I think, reduce the capability of, of solar sites to provide for biodiversity. One is the sort of um, the burning desire to mow everything as often as possible um, on the basis that if you don't, then there'll be a shade issue, um, <clears throat> which seems to be the primary reason. Another is to um, graze these sites and grazing with sheep is absolutely fine. But and if you look at the photograph at the bottom right, which I scavenged from the Internet, um, um, so kind of apologies to whoever was the originator. Um, <clears throat> but that says to me everything that is wrong with grazing far, far, far too many animals which have grazed the ground into to a less than a billiard table that is not sequestering any carbon there are no um, flowers pr providing nectar sources for insects there are no nesting sites for birds um, nowhere for small mammals or um, brown hares or anything like that there'll be no foraging bats over it um, so other than providing um, somewhere for, for sheep to graze and get fat it's it serves very very little purpose at all um and so that's for us is is quite key but again biodiversity net gain because it has a quality metric to it means that um you can sow a type of grassland and you then have to manage it in a way sensitive to the, to that quality otherwise you fail your biodiversity net gain um and there are quite severe penalties if if you do that um and then i've put in disturbance by maintenance teams but actually relative because there is a security fence around these the vast majority of these anyway that that's relatively low frequency they're not there very often even if they're mowing quite regularly they're probably doing it from a tractor and so forth so so long as there are habitats available for the birds or the uh, butterflies and so on but it's the birds that are primarily um affected by disturbance so how do we work with um, solar developers? I um, mean, you know, we, as I say, we worked with two. Um, we're hoping and um, very much want to continue to work with Lightrock for for many years to come, um, because it it 
it creates opportunities for for us to be able to get as much wildlife in, into these sites as, as we possibly can. We and to do it in you know these three elements of biodiversity net gain, integrating species and optimizing nature-based solutions in one package. And so we uh, look at the species that are present in the locality, those that have got declining conservation status. And I've included a picture of a corn bunting here, which has plummeted in numbers over the last 40, 50 years. 86% decline, I think it is across the country, quite large areas where it's disappeared from, and primarily because the loss of um, nesting habitat that doesn't get harvested in the middle of the breeding season, um, but also loss of food, and we can provide all of that in solar sites. So if there are corn buntings in, in the locality, and we've got good data to say where these species are, um then we can include the prescriptions that they need within the the matrix of of habitats uh, in the design um we also look to see whether there are any particular habitat features in in the locality as well so if it's chalkland can we do something to increase the area of chalk grassland um if it's sandy can we create exposures that will help solitary bees and so forth and uh, yeah, just to repeat the point about showcasing, this is, you know, it's a recurring thing because it's so important to be able to convince uh, or just illustrate to others that this is achievable um, and it isn't a necessarily a, a significant um, cost to the, the operator and certainly not to the, um, the developer. Um, the cost of, of implementing these measures initially creating them is about the same as um, the just saying a standard grass mix. So a bit on biodiversity net gain. Um, some of you may well be familiar with it and even work with it, um, in which case this will be kind of um, well, it'll be interesting to see whether what I'm saying is, is similar to your understanding. But um, in in fundament, the, the the primary thing is if if land is taken out of uh, its current land use as as a you know, green landscape, as in farmed or or semi natural habitats or whatever, in order to be able to get planning permission, you have to be able to demonstrate, or you will from November of this year. But many local authorities are already insisting, um, and that's good. Um, that you can deliver 10% more by way of biodiversity value than you had originally. And when you look at a solar site and you think, oh, right, okay, well, this is actually quite a large take of the land in 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 terms of the array of, of, of panels on the um on the landscape. So how does that work? Um what you do is you assess the existing and then you plug that. So you need the area data for the amount of existing habitats by type. And you put that into um, a standard calculator that Natural England have published. It's freely available um, to download. <clears throat> and that, and you tell the, the calculator what habitat it is. So in this case, it's arable fields. So in the table on the, at the bottom, as I put 20 hectares, I've no idea how big that site is, but just for the sake of argument, I put 20 hectares in to the develop, uh, to the calculator. And it told me that that equates to 40 units, biodiversity units. So you have to provide 44 biodiversity units at the end of the day in order to be able to um, demonstrate the 110% the um <clears throat> a small proportion of it will be lost to tracks and hard standing and so forth so that's zero i've said two hectares here the area in and i don't know would you be able to see my cursor but the down to the south of the site and up through there's a big hedgerow running through the middle and then there's a bit in the left hand corner and so forth on average, that array uh, amounts to about 20, 25, 30% of, of a site is not developed with so with, with panels. 
out with the panels, in other words, I've estimated here four hectares. That is then sown with a wildflower grassland mix in the calculator, it's called other neutral grassland. Um, and that generates of medium quality. So that generates 24.7 units. Um, the land between the panels is uh, roughly about 50% of the array out that is, is covered in panels is actually bare ground between the panels. It varies by site a bit, aspect and so forth. But that is um, also able to be same with the same quality of, of mix and maintained in that way. So 43 units. And then the bit underneath the panels, and this is where we disagree with some analysts who use the same quality um, attribute for under the panels as between the panels, but we would argue that it gets no rain and is shaded all day, every day. Therefore, would could not achieve the same quality of, of grassland type. So I've scored this as poor. But the point here is that you end up with um, a vastly improved um, output in terms of biodiversity net gain. And because it's wildflower grassland, and I've kept this simple just with wildflower grassland, and I've made the assumption that the hedgerow, as is there, all of the hedgerows were maintained, kept, so there's no impact from that, that you end up with 140% biodiversity net gain against a baseline of we needing 110. Um, so that shows that, by, that that solar sites can really deliver. If I then did the exercise again, which I should have done, I guess, but with all of the features that we'd want to see, then it would probably get towards 200%. Um, just to be clear, the scores that are uh, generated are generated by the calculator. You don't have any influence on those. They're all fixed values. So it's it's a very objective way of, of looking at um, habitats. Um, and therefore, hopefully you can see, the other thing I should have said is if, if it was a species rich grassland already, um, then, and you wanted to develop solar on it, you would get a negative score because you would lose the quality underneath the panels and you would lose the um, the, the land to, that's, that's going to be hard standing and, and tracks and so on. So you would then, that's one of the reasons why you would struggle to justify developing um, a solar site on an already existing decent quality um, habitat like species rich grassland you could pay for an offset but that really would be a very expensive way of, of going about things so that's kind of how biodiversity net gain works sorry i think there's yeah oh and i did say uh, yes it's it's a very simplified approach um the other points that you need to bear in mind is that that quality and extent has to be there throughout the 30 years minimum. And again, some local authorities, and we would support this, are aiming for longer. Some local authorities, and again, we would support this, are asking for 120% as a minimum as well. And then the final point here is biodiversity net gain. It assumes that the habitats created to provide for the species and this is one of the challenges we've got with it, because often species need an assemblage, a very carefully kind of developed assemblage of habitats, um, which is how we work, um, which can fit within the net gain thing. But the net gain doesn't prompt um, anything beneficial for specific species. <clears throat> So I said quite a lot of this in, in um, what I've just covered now uh, before. Um, thing to note here is under open space, 20 to 30% can be quite a lot of land. So 150 hectares of solar farm isn't that unusual these days. And that would generate 45 hectares of open ground, which is again, quite significant. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> I'm gonna talk more about the habitats in a moment. So I want to quickly show you this, just a very rough piece of analysis of the kind of things that you can do within the solar development 
that will attract or support um, priority species. And these are RSPB priority species. And they're priorities because, with one or two exceptions, actually, barn owl isn't. But because of the scale of decline in their state of conservation status, turtle doves and willow tits have declined by more than 90% in the last 40 years they're knocking on the door of extinction in this country in the right places where they occur you can do some really good and useful things in solar sites for species like that um and turtle doves are, are um very much a south southeastern um uh species and we know that the prescriptions work um, and so you can get a rapid response where the, those birds are. But I wouldn't really just for you to notice the number of species that solar farms can help. And these are all species that are in conservation, you know, real trouble. And that the measures are those kind of measures that I've talked about and we'll talk about in a moment. Um, the one exception really is around breeding waders where um, they and um, solar panels don't mix. So you, if there are breeding waders like lapwings on pasture um, that you want to develop, you'd have to do mitigation. But we've done that successfully for curlews in North Yorkshire with light rock. Um, and they've they've identified and taken a lease out on an, ex, an extension to the to the development site, which they're not developing um, for, for solar, um, but is specifically for um, uh, mitigation. And to make the point that there are an array of other uh, wildlife than um, just birds. We don't just focus on birds as an organization, but we use birds as sort of symbols of the, the um, uh, environmental quality, ecological quality of land. So just really um, sort of drawing this towards a close, the some some um, just little pointers on on habitats, the kind of things that can be incorporated. I apologise, I haven't got photographs of all of these features in um, solar sites yet. So, but they are some of them are taken from our Hope Farm, like the the one in the bottom left and the the the, the uh, marble white butterfly. Um, um, Whereas I said, these are an, an analogous. So providing features like tussocky grassland, you simply just don't mow um, areas uh, for probably two to three years at times um, and allow the build-up of, of the, the sort of structure which benefits small mammals and orthoptera, grasshoppers and crickets, um, but butterflies and other insects. And then wintering bird foraging habitat, which is crucial. One of the primary reasons for birds having farmer birds having declined is the loss of winter food. And again, through simple things like a minor cultivation within areas, um, non-operational areas, you can provide this. Season-long nectar is a very important point, is to have an array of species that are in flower throughout, really from February through to October, November, because bumblebees in particular have got very, very long um, activity seasons. And a lot of the problem is where those have been broken and then open grass them for nesting birds. Um, and then something a bit more peripheral, a bit more kind of specific, but easily. And we have in all of, uh, for all of these examples, um, Put these in but or, or retained and enhanced in terms of hedgerows and hedgerow trees um left to the north of the site um so that they're not shading um very high value this photograph at the bottom left is hope farm again showing all the birds that are using the hedgerow and then diving into the food to to the ground to forage and insect banks hibernacular for uh, reptiles, for um, insects, for uh, amphibians and so on, really, really important and really easy to put in. Um, and again, depending on the ground, um, but open water is, is a vital asset. So nature-based solutions, nature services, if you will. Um, I mentioned the carbon take up from the, the ground the, the the quality of the of this i think is is underestimated i think some of the research is now suggesting that 
rested grasslands can absorb huge amounts of carbon relative to their area. Um, pollination, uh, um, the, the value of pollination to British agriculture is measured in the hundreds of millions of pounds a year, and it's assessed on the basis of its deficit. In other words, um, what is lost by way of productivity by having too little pollination. So if you add pollination, pollinating plants to um, solar farms, which are surrounded by arable farmland, then you end up with a real benefit to the surrounding farmland. And likewise, things like um, the carabid beetles, ladybirds, the little black round, they're all out into the crop and hammering things like aphids and so on. They're all carnivorous. And so do a really significant job. And just by way of example, on our Hope Farm, which is a very traditionally managed in the past farm, because of the measures we've put in place, we no longer have to use insecticides at all for things like aphids, or for anything. But, you know, we, in standard farming practice, aphid control is, has, has to be done because it will destroy a crop otherwise in, in peak years. Pollution filtration I mentioned before, um, also slowing the flow of runoff and often we know when you see storms, um, you know, the, the pictures of the rivers going into flood, they're all brown and that's the silt topsoil running off the fields. And then people's well-being and just having that, and I think, that, you know, Liz, before the, um, the meeting opened, we were talking about ability to roam and and um, you know, the value really of being able to walk through countryside that's full of wildlife um, cannot be underestimated. <clears throat> and then this is my last slide. Um, and it's really about how um, we can kind of engage people to um, understand and value um, the role of solar, solar sites, not just for the energy they produce, but as the sort of the asset that they, they are to um, you know, nature and how they have a very small impact, almost insignificant impact on things like food security. I think we need to have more evidence of the nature response to solar. I think it's, it's too new an industry to have been properly researched. Lancaster University are doing great stuff um, to, to fill that gap, but we need that in order to provide the evidence base and then to showcase, to, to profile the best examples, um, you know, and then making sure that operators have got access to the best advice, whether that's us or anybody else, from the point of view of being able to deliver this, um, I think are key. Um, and this is in the context of the potential uh, for some very, very large solar schemes. Um, the one around Gainsborough in Lincolnshire is, I think there are four developers and the total there is 7,000 hectares. And it, I mean, at a landscape, that's a huge impact. It could be immense for biodiversity, but that doesn't kind of... Um, justify it in the sense that um you know communities have have a a very different landscape to have to um to deal with um so i think there's a balance in this and we're not necessarily in the business of uh, objecting on grounds of scale um as an organization but i think we sympathize with with local communities who are anxious about that scale versus the, the sort of more traditional sort of 50 to 100 hectare type developments. I think, that, as I say, that's my last slide. Yes, it is. So I'll try and stop sharing there. And um, hand Thank you very back. much, Nigel. That was uh, very informative. Um, at the moment, I've only seen one question come up in the chat box, though I have got lots of questions. So if no one else has questions, I'll throw hundreds at you. But for now, I'm just going to hand over to Phil from Net Carbon Zero. Phil, you've got a question? Yeah, hi. Um, I have a client that's about to, oh, well, he's, he's in the middle of actually installing a one, mega, one megawatt solar array on land at the side of his uh, milk processing plant which is on a farmland in Denbydale and a couple of weeks ago we were up there and we were walking around 
and we were trying to work out what sort of wildlife habitats that we can put back into the land. Uh, the reason he's used the land, it's non-productive anyways, because mm. it's, got, it's got a ground loop for um, a ground source heat pump that we installed about four years ago for him. So we, it's very interesting what you're going through this morning because we've tr started to try to explore what we can actually put on that land to increase the habitat for the local wildlife. Um, you know, we, we could we sort of, could we put hedges in there? What type of wildflowers could we put in there? Do you have any information on your website or something that you could send us or perhaps liaise with us and advise us on which way to do it correctly? I think the easiest answer is maybe to pick this one up off offline um <clears throat> so very happy for you to to drop me an email in principle though um yeah the you you need to match the type of um wildflower mix to your soils so you can't you know and if, if you go to like the um emma's gate website they've got a whole array of different seed mixes which suit different soil types and so he'll know exactly what his ground is is like and therefore be able to choose one that, that fits but right. all of them pretty much then you know respond in the same sort of way um so they're you know different fertilities different um water soil moisture content etc but they'll still respond in the same way and and in simple terms um mowing the bits that need mowing late in the season after things have flowered and seeded is the way to go um and if you can avoid mowing everything in every year then that's even better for the reasons that i'd said um okay. then um the, the the question about hedges absolutely we usually suggest to the north so what we want um and what nature wants really is to have bigger than your average farm hedges let them grow up a bit and out so there is a potential kind of depending on on the lie of the land for those to provide you know to be a shade in certain circumstances so i'm just sort of suggesting that take account of the shading um really when when did you know thinking about location hedgerows but hedgerows are brilliant for wildlife um you know and if you've got a, a mix of species of like thorn and and um field maple and that sort of stuff going in there then wildlife will absolutely love it so okay. um yeah and yes i saw it in the chat i'm very happy to to share my um email address thank you thank you because there was discussion about what you're talking about the hedges we covered that because there was some discussion about putting up security fencing because there's a lot of walkers in the area mm. and it it was immediately dismissed by us because horrible green metal and plastic fencing yeah. that environment yeah. ain't going to happen it's as simple as that so let's just put hedges in there but which one do we actually put in mm. so you know it'd be great if you could give, give us some advice and uh we're happy to work with you and use it as a case to be going forward if you like um, because it really is, I, I totally agree with what you said today, is that it's all about returning those habitats and wherever possible, actually increasing them at the same yeah. time as generating green power, basically. So thank you very much for that. Absolutely. Yeah, and it, it sounds like you've got a fantastic scheme there. If you're putting um, ground source heat, heat in underneath it as well, then it's a total, it's a triple win then. <laughs> well, we've got other stuff going on there because it, it, the, the the goal with the client is to actually become, as he says, the greenest milkman in the land um, because he's processing like two and a half million litres of milk a week. And over the years, we've put ground source heat pump in. There's a megawatt and a half of biomass boilers in there. Um, the solar PV array is going in there. We're looking at other quick wins now. And then once we've done that, we will then move on to doing the scope one, two and three emissions and addressing the 500 tons of milk fats and solids that he's got as waste. And we've got a plan for that to cultivate 
black soldier fly larvae and turn that into an eco fertilizer later on. That sounds great, Bill. Um, I'm just going to interrupt because I see that. Oh, thank you. Nigel just put his email in there. Um, thank you. We have got quite, a, I noticed that we've got quite a lot of people from local authorities who have joined this call. So um, if local authorities have a particular local authority related question, do please put them in the chat or raise your hand because you may have uh, different questions than um, community energy groups and, um, you know, just concerned citizens, shall we say. I've got a couple of questions about um, the end of the, the end of life of a, a solar farm. Um, uh, so I've asked Richard Knox Johnson has a question to ask Nigel. I don't know if you can answer this. Um, Richard, do you want to go ahead? Thank you very much, Liz. Um, yes, my question is at the end of, say, 40 years where planning permission is normally given, uh, or if you like, when the solar panels have uh, outused their usefulness, um, the arrangements for removing it. At the present moment, there appears to be no arrangements whatsoever that they will then be removed and that they will then be a derelict site on the countryside. And I wondered what views he had on that. Yes, I don't know about the sort of the technicalities. I think that's one that lives with the, the planning authority and, and the there's usually a thing called a section 106 agreement, which goes with every um, planning development, which will detail including the so i work with the minerals industry the quarrying sector quite a bit and they have to produce very detailed plans as to how they're going to close the site and what they're going to put it back to but i think in principle um and my views um based slightly on on um discussion with with the the people we've worked with like rock and unesco i think they feel very much that they would seek to keep those sites open beyond their current uh permitted life in other words apply for further on the basis that um their their existing and an existing development i think they would then re-panel so the technology in in solar panels is moving forward quite quickly um and i mean one of the things that's that's being introduced is panels that that tip to track the sun um as being much more efficient and so forth so i think that the the value to the to, to the operator of keeping those those sites and keeping them active rather than derelict i think is is too high for it to be a significant risk well, you, uh, yes, you, you say that, but unfortunately, there is no uh, system of paying for it. And it would be quite easy for the company to go into liquidation and say, we haven't got any money and therefore we're going to leave it as it is. Also, uh, the thing you haven't mentioned is the alternative to this is to put it on roof space. We have 250,000 hectares of roof space. And I wondered what your view on that was, bearing in mind that very little of it has yeah. solar panels on it. Yeah, so I did mention that right at the beginning, and and I think we, um, I we, I think the scale of need of solar energy or low carbon energy sources is so great that it it should be a combination, and we have actively lobbied for uh, rooftop solar um, for a number of reasons, but one of the ones that's that's got a. a, a there's a biodiversity uh, angle to rooftop solar where it's on flat roofs and if it's put on flat roofs that are then got a, a green roof so uh, which helps with insulation and runoff and so forth and it, it the green roof improves the efficiency of the panels because the panels don't get too hot and so you know that's for us the win-win um, and so we're quite strong on advocating that I, I, I think that every commercial building this is my my own personal opinion should have solar panels on them um absolutely be the default um and, and make it very difficult to make exceptions simply because of the need uh, so i agree with you in principle i also feel that field solar where it's in the right place and what is right is is another debate but from our point of view it's minimal impact on biodiversity but from community's point of view it could be in terms of impact on landscape and all that sort of stuff um, you know, there has to be a, um, a kind of an approach that, that enables us 
as a country to generate so much more of our energy from low carbon sources because the current and i'd include gas natural gas um is is a um it's not working you know we've got one and a half degrees temperature rise it's going to be almost impossible to avoid two two and a half degree temperature rise and we can see the impact that that's having now just on one quick point if i may there's a question come up on a 106 agreement generally required decommissioning bond they don't i'm afraid that isn't happening so there isn't a decommissioning bond I'm afraid that's misinformation. Sorry, thank you very much indeed, Liz. I'll, I'll shut up now. <laughs> thank you, Richard. We've got two more questions, Keith Baker and then Noel Lambert. And then I'm going to hand over to, um, I'm going to hand over to Andrew, our other speaker. Um, so Keith. Yes, it's, it's, um, it's less of a question and more just uh, um, pointing, just to point something out. I missed the beginning, so apologies if you've, if you've done through this before, but the previous speaker um, who was working with the farmer in, I think, Denby Dale, I think this highlights the need to get ecologists involved when planning these schemes and also um, landscape architects to ensure that the landscape character is retained as much as possible and the historic landscape character is preserved. So when we are thinking about putting in hedgerows or trees, trying to work with that existing structure as much as possible, I would just kind of drop that in as a landscape architect um, and and rather than kind of guesstimating what sort of hedge mix you get or what benefits if you just get an ecologist in that will that would be probably money well spent I would think. Thank you Keith. Now you have a question. Hi there yeah um, sorry I missed the last bit of the presentation so I, I wasn't sure if it was covered but I just wondered Nigel is there any um, value or uh, uh, elements in the modeling around no, connecting up saying. these areas of um biodiversity so under solar farms or pre-existing to create wildlife corridors or migration sort of pathways or anything like that yes i just saw your your piece in the uh, your question in the chat and was just about to ripple oh right <laughs> to it in in right Absolutely, there is. No. And I think one of the things, because we work with a number of different industries and, and sectors, I mentioned quarrying, we also work with golf and, and so on, and with farming, um, you know, and part of that is to look at how you can join nature up through the landscape um, <clears throat> and by, by integrating or working these, these different kind of components together. Um, and one of the areas that we've looked at is in South Cambridgeshire, and um, we've got a small nature reserve at Falmere, um, but it's got two solar farms, three solar farms near it, and there's a, a golf course and a quarry. And when you start to look at those on the map, they're almost joined up. So then you can go and talk to the farmers and do get them to, to hopefully to do agri-environment uh, measures between between them so you get those corridors and and you know you're right wildlife needs to have connected habitats for it to be able to move around the countryside absolutely thanks thanks for answering that thank you uh, before we move on i'm going to indulge in a couple of questions um if that's okay first of all uh, nigel is there a central register of um, all the different, um, actually, Andrew, you may be able to answer this too, of all the solar farms and kind of like a leaderboard about which ones are more biodiverse and which ones are rubbish? I can answer the second bit. There isn't there isn't a, um, a kind of league table of, of quality. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure whether we want to go down the, down the route of naming and shaming. I think we're kind of more empowering more carrot than stick should we say <laughs> but i think that works if you can if you can advocate a uh, showcase um the best then the rest know where they are in relation to that and if we can at the same time show um, i kept mentioning it but didn't actually talk about it but the the the, the cost of putting in you know a more biodiverse um Sort of vegetation um, is just the same uh, as as doing a standard grass mix, um, you know, with with one or two exceptions, like you know, if you're creating ponds and things like that. But they're minor costs that are one off, um, and so it really is. There's there's no blockage 
from our point of view to implementing a high biodiversity kind of a high nature value um, outcomes for these places. Okay, thank you. So my, and my second sort of follow up question, which will lead into Andrew's presentation is um, lots of people on this call are not necessarily solar developers, certainly not developing solar farms, but they will be, uh, you know, they might have a solar farm near to them and they might have a solar farm that looks filled with butterflies or there might be a solar farm near them that looks, you know, like that picture of the, the, the one that you show that just, mm. just looks like a desert. Is there anything that local people that you're aware of or do you have any programs to support local people to kind of hold a local solar farm to account, as it were, or to work with the solar farm to to enable the to encourage the solar farm to increase biodiversity? Yeah, that's a really interesting question, actually. And I think there's this part of a solution where we've well, we've developed a program. Um, we now need to find a way of, of funding it so it could work at scale. Um, and we're calling it volunteer monitoring of farm wildlife. So you could put in brackets solar in the middle of there and then you get the answer. But the idea there is that um, local folk with an interest in wildlife could receive some training on how to identify different species. It doesn't have to be all of them, um, of butterfly, bird, etc and um, do what we call standard walks. So they walk a certain route a certain number of times in the year. And then that's really a, the product of that is for the farmer or for the, the solar operator in this instance. The challenge, and I think this is exactly as you say, this is where it comes to um, Andrew's talk, is, is how to make contact with and get permission for access into into the solar sites to be able to do that monitoring but i think that would be immensely valuable as a kind of big data set for how good or bad solar sites can be and that would really kind of help to you know the 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 the, the operator to then kind of well, with a farmer, we point the we the, the volunteers point the farmer to our advice on farming. So we could do exactly the same and point them to our advice or third party advice or whoever owns it, it doesn't matter as long as it's the right advice. Right. That's something I'd really like us to be able to roll out with all, all the groups that we work with. Um, um it's expensive, yeah. so we have to find a way of funding it. <laughs> uh, okay, well, let, let's have a chat about that later. I'm going to hand over to Andrew Common now, um, who is going to tell us something, how to access some information that you don't have to get through Finley Colville at Solar Media. <laughs> Thanks, Liz. I'm going to share screen. Um, there we go. I'm actually going to share in this view because um, I'm going to switch between tabs a lot. Um, my talk's going to be pretty quick. Um but yeah, so I work at Bureau Happel, we're um, an engineering consultancy, so we actually been seeing a lot of work with local authorities, sort of where shall we, if we want to appraise our holy local authority, where's the best place to put solar farms? And a lot of this information I'm going to highlight here just comes from those approaches. Um, we do it all in a posh model, as a lot of other companies do. But actually, if you're just interested in individual sites and understanding those contexts, there's no reason why you need any software to do it. You can view it all online. Um, so the first bit um, is looking at where to find renewable projects and understand where they are. So the UK government publish a quarterly database of every single renewable project at any status. So these are things it's quite useful, actually. So it's includes sites which are sought planning permission, which has been rejected. And it's not just solar, it looks at wind, it looks at biomass, it's got everything in there. So um, the presentation will be shared afterwards. But yeah, essentially, there's a link here, which will take you to this website. And from this, so people can do work their own example while you're doing it, Andrew. Oh, brilliant. Um, yeah, so there's two formats, um, CSV and Excel. Um, CSV is what I download to use in our program, but Excel is actually more useful if you don't have a GIS software to use. So um, I've downloaded it already. And 
it's quite a big spreadsheet with uh, useful definitions, just saying um, a little bit more on everything. And what you've got here is who the operator of the site is, um, what site name is, and a little bit on the address. And so this sort of gives you enough to, for most of these sites, start to do a Google of the contact details. Um, the best way to get any kind of information and detail about a site is um, through probably local authority planning portal generally. Um, you can also run queries. Once you've identified these sites, you can pass it over to um, HM Land Registry um, and they can tell you the owner, but there's a, I think it's three pounds charge on it, um, which is okay for one site, but sometimes um, if you're doing multiple, it gets a bit expensive. But as I said, it's every single renewable type. So if you're just interested in solar, it's pretty self-explanatory. You can just um, look at um, solar photovoltaics here. And then you can also um, filter on various things as well. And that includes um, planning bodies. Um, so you can filter on the county um, is one of them. So if we just use... I'll use East Sussex as an example, as I've got it in some other places. So this is all the large solar sites. So this is ground solar or rooftop solar uh, over 150 kilowatts generally. Um, sometimes they miss out some of the rooftop solar, but there's, yeah. So it's got the installed capacity um, in here. And it's also got the, sorry, I'm used to the CSV format, so development status here as well so if you want to just look at um what's actually operating you can find these sites here and then you can start to have a look at what's sort of going on with those so light source renewables have the most um in east sussex uh, anyone sort of knows it probably won't be a particularly big surprise but and you can see there's um large rooftop of tesco so you can just then um, sort of go in here have a look at the address information and do a google Google search essentially to find those sites. Um, what I would say is, yeah, the planning database is going to give you more information and potentially a better contact detail. But with a bit of Googling, if you're just interested in a couple, you can probably find it there. Fortunately, I didn't actually know this until I was checking um, the other day, but um, the UK government have actually got um, an online version of that. So you can view it on a map, which is really useful. Um, and if we go here, uh, yeah, so you can have a look at this one. Um, this is for everything. So you can filter it on, if you're just interested in solar photovoltaics again, you can do that and you can do the reset. Let's turn it back on, but yeah, if you see here, select all solar photovoltaics, loads in a bit, and there you go. You can close this up and then also you can have a look at the status again. So this is the planning permission status, everything selected at the moment. So again, operational. And then you can zoom in. And uh, the example I used before was um, this one here. Um, so you can have a look at it. It's got a bit of information, but that big Excel file has got a bit more in there. So probably more useful to go and have a check on that, but this will let you identify it and you can go between them. But also you can search the planning application reference number and that's how you get the most information. So this is quite an easy way to do it. Um, and then what I would say with it though, is this example here, it's always worth having a look to get to know the site, um, have a look on Google Satellite or something. So this is where it's showing it, but actually, as you can see, it's a bit away from where the solar panels are. They're all the way up here. So um, useful for that initial identification, checking it's in the area, but just worth that check. So I think for this example, it's probably at the substation link or the farm address. But yeah, that's sort of the main data set um, we use. And it's uh, in our modeling, it's also quite useful to see what was rejected if we're looking at that technology and dig into why it was rejected, because quite often you're going to be flagging sites if you're looking for ones for development where someone else has looked at it before. There's a reason they would have looked at it. So if it's been rejected, it's useful to have a look at what the reason is behind that. The other thing I'm just going to touch on, which is essentially the end of my slides, is um, a really useful 
centralized data set um, for the environment and ecological context. And also it's got some historical context as well called Magic Map. Um, just minimize it a second here. So with this, um, you've followed the link and you'll come to essentially this. It's got a lot of useful information in it. Um, so designations and habitats and species would tend to be the ones we'd look at um, in the majority of cases for our solar appraisals. And it's also probably the most useful to sort of get that context about what kind of habitat is there. So what kind of species you should be looking for. So on the habitat example, this will probably take a little bit of time to load, but I've got one loaded in for here. So this is priority habitats of lowland uh, grasslands. And so you can see sort of where those are highlighted here. And so of course you need to be sensitive to those areas. And also it's useful for that context of what's going on around the solar farm. So our solar farm was up here, so nothing shown there. It's not just um, so things like grassland. You've also got species here as well. So uh, species, which was mentioned, I think, was lapwings. So you can put on the information here. And it's slightly coarse resolution, but it shows across the whole of the UK where the big areas where you'd be looking for lapwings are. And it's got corn buntings and a few other species in there. Um, there are other maps available with more detailed species, but this is just quite an initial starting point for some of those key ones. Um, doesn't cover everything. Um, so that's habitats. Another, probably the most important one when we do our site appraisal is designations. And what's useful about this is it's split between statutory and non-statutory. Um, and so for some of these statutory ones, we would not be looking to develop at all on them. Um, have seen things go on Ramsar sites, which is a little bit odd, but um, we would not be looking to develop on Ramsar sites, try and avoid those completely. And even more than Ramsar sites, a uh, very important one, triple uh, SIs, so sites of special scientific interest. Andrew, what's a Ramsar site? Nigel, do you want to, you're probably better placed to give the definition of that than me, actually. I'll just give something very loose. <laughs> Oh, sorry, you're on mute. <laughs> but ah, right, can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, Ramsar is it's it's a, a place um, where a convention um, was was developed an international. It's beyond Europe um, global convention um, that sought to protect important wetland sites um, across the world. So it's the Ramsar Convention, and then designated sites UK government and Europe um adopted it as part of the statutory uh, protections thank you I'm sure I wasn't but, the only to know that yeah and yeah the triple SIs are probably a little bit more widely known about so what's useful with this site is and we don't some of the data sets don't always show us is sort of what the status of the triple SIs are so you'd never be building on a triple SI um for a renewable development but it gives you that context of what's going on nearby and even if you're developing near one you need to be very conscious of yeah. that and we have some when we tend to do this modeling we've got some quite strong buffers we put around to avoid developing near triple SIs um you don't want to be impacting these these are really key sites and as you can see it's got what the condition of those triple SIs are from the monitoring which is very useful um the final one I will flag up on the designation side um, is on the landscape. This is quite useful to have a look at. Um, the main one being agricultural land. So we've heard a bit about that conflict between what you're developing on and what the general guidance coming out is now. It's been changing a lot recently from UK government. And there's two grades of agricultural grade land, three, which is the, quite the large majority of agricultural land and 3a is considered two prime agricultural land to develop on whereas 3b will generally get permission if there's not other issues there there's sensitivities to it but that's quite a key sensitivity and actually you can't really know that until you monitor the site you need to get a soil specialist in to check that agricultural land grade so that's quite a key bit but what you can also see is grade four and five these would generally be, from an agricultural perspective, what's most important to do. 
but then of course there's a broader picture here on the biodiversity and if these are not often used for farming they may be more significant from a species perspective so you need to have a look at those things together but yeah you it's good to have that context there just to understand sort of what's going on on the agricultural land so if you were a solar developer you'd probably be looking at grades four and five initially without any other context there but essentially what you do is just pull that information in and yeah have a look there um i did include a link which is not in the presentation as well um so this thing here if you do use gis um it's an open data set and essentially it breaks up the uk into different land parcels sadly it doesn't have the contact details of those um for those land parcels you'd need to um put a request in but it's sort of you can sh you can bring that into a GIS map if you've got skills like that, or there's plenty of um, videos online on how to start developing those skills. Um, if community energy groups are interested. I think we've got had some previous um, projects with um, Community Energy South and previous um, talks I've done where there's some videos on some introductory bits. But essentially, it allows you to download a data set which you can put into your GIS and see actually this. Um, solar farm sits on one landowner that um, area's got an id which again you can just send off to get that um, uh, those contact details as well it's another way to do it and that's more what happens if you're sort of looking at work um, as a community energy group and you've identified what you think would be a good site that would sort of be your first step to identifying landowners would probably be this way um, go through like that yeah, so that's my very quick overview. Hopefully there's some useful links there. Um, was more what I wanted to highlight and that you can actually do a lot of this searching online um, quite quickly. Um, but yeah, I think it's really good that the government have got the central map out here so you don't need any JIR skills or software to sort of be interpreting it. Um, so I will stop sharing there and hand back to you, Liz. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, I hope that was useful for people. Um, um, if no questions have come up, but I'm imagining people might be um, accessing the links themselves and, and finding out if there are projects in their area that they weren't aware of. Um, but I don't know. Don't know. Uh, are there any more questions or things people want to say? Raise your hand, unmute yourself, or put something in the chat box. Um, Can I just um, pick up on the, the last point that and Andrew was making about um, soils and best and most versatile? We've we've run into this a couple of times with um, uh, solar developments, and it's interesting because the DEFRA guidance, um, which is produced by Natural England, does make quite clear the case that you can develop on better quality soils on the basis that it is returnable it's a reversible um uh, process and it's quite explicit that that's the case however and i think where where it's become uh, an issue is in the local authority policies um which tend to be very much kind of uh, less nuanced if you like and say um no development on best and most versatile land um but the government guidance does allow for it which i find intriguing uh sorry i i missed that because i was responding to something else um henry you have a question yeah um i'm not sure whether i've had an answer to this one i raised in the chat um it's uh, i um well a neighboring farm had been invited to participate in in a grand managed solar scheme and uh, turned down the uh, the idea because they discovered that um it would mean they would never be able to arable farm in the future but because there would be certain um uh uh, what else, you know stuff left in the ground after the uh, panels were removed at the end of the period um has anybody come across this and is it, is it actually true that that would be the case can either of you answer that i've to be honest i've not come across it directly i've not but i've not seen it be an issue for solar it is an issue for wind quite a lot more because the foundations are very expensive to remove for wind because they're huge concrete blocks but 
I'm yeah. I've not seen it as an issue for solar, but there will be things in the there will be things in the ground that should be relatively straightforward to move. It's not got the same foundational requirements as wind. But but at least I'm with wind, expert, it's yeah. a very small area, which is yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah. Well, for, for solar, it could be a very large area. I'm just well, looking for reassurance on that particular technical point. No, no other comments. Uh, okay. Um, well, in that case, I just want to say what I have learned from today. Oh, there's more comments going into the chat box there, Henry. Um, but but what I've learned from today, actually, is for the people who are really, really anti-solar farms, and there are a few out there, I think, uh, I think the, it looks like the best way to make sure a solar farm doesn't happen in your area is to be sure is to make sure that the land around you is incredibly biodiverse already because then the solar farm won't be able to increase biodiversity so there won't there's be no point in them building it so if you're a real solar farm nimby i think that that that's my advice on the way forward which i think is a pretty positive bit of advice um it might not be what nigel was expecting to be said but that's certainly what i've learned from this does anyone else have any other questions or comments there's some comments going into the chat box I see and I'm having difficulty keeping up on it oh they, these are just comments about um yeah end of life with solar farms are there any other questions or is there anything else people wanted to learn and haven't because if not I will suggest that we actually end this call early which is very unusual for us um I do hope it's been helpful for you all Oh, good. I'm glad to hear it, Henry. <laughs> um, I hope this has been helpful to you all. As I said to somebody else earlier, if you want to download the chat box, because then you'll get all of the links uh, in the chat box, just where it says type message here, there are three little dots. And if you click on the three little dots, you can save the chat. Uh, so you'll get all of the links. Um, and there's lots of interesting uh, comments going into the chat. Kelly, have you got anything you want to add? No. Andrew or Nigel? No. Okay, well, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for your participation. Um, if there are subjects, because, you know, we run these webinars monthly, if there's something you feel we're really missing and you'd really like to learn about, uh, do please email me and let me know, because uh, I've been doing this for quite a few years now, and I'm wondering if we're going to run out of topics. So do let me know if there's something that you're feeling we should you could re you'd really like to learn about. And otherwise, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Thanks for coming.